Um, so thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Tierney and I'm here to talk to you about mapping of Ant the mapping of Antarctica at National Geographic and our most recent Antarctica map that was published earlier this year. National Geographic's interest in Antarctica began in 1892 when it sent a small team of scientists to the southern continent to build on previous work by other explorers like Mendana in 1567, La Roche in 1672, Cook in 1773. Four steam whalers set off from Dundee in Scotland, an expedition that would result in this map of Antarctica by Dr. James Murray. This beautiful hand-drawn map was one of the first, was the first of many Antarctica maps in the magazine. To date, National Geographic has featured over 50 maps of Antarctica and the Arctic, making the poles one of the most heavily mapped geographies on the globe. This is our first supplement map of Antarctica, featured in the October 1932 edition. State-of-the-art aerial cameras, as they were known at the time, brought unprecedented images of the great southern continent, allowing a level of mapping that had never been seen before at National Geographic. The map shows significant progress that, that, had, been made, or that had been made charting the coastline since Murray's attempt 38 years prior. With this map, National Geographic rounded out its mission to provide its readers with a wall chart of all major divisions of the world. As time passed, so did our love love affair with Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula. This single page magazine map exhibits beautiful hand-drawn relief in perspective looking down the peninsula to the South Shetland Islands. In 2011, cartographers Ginny Mason and Steve Tyson mapped Scott and Am Amundsen's expeditions to the South Pole in the early 1900s. The colors, texturing, and perspective truly places the reader in the landscape with the explorers. Today, the tradition continues with National Geographic actively pursuing its ongoing interest in Antarctica, in particular the effect that climate change is having on the continent. Earlier this year, myself, my colleague J Jason Treat, and freelancer Steve Tyson created this map of Antarctica, highlighting the impact of climate change on the continent. For this latest project, as with all of our projects in National Geographic, the final product was no easy task. At National Geographic, we go through an intensive process of multiple critiques, edits, adjustments, and more tweaks, and it all starts with a sketch. This is my first brainstorming sketch for our 2017 Antarctica map. Uh, I remember making this during a meeting for another story I was working on with the sketch buried amongst the meeting notes. Not the prettiest, but even the roughest sketch is critical to getting into the creative mindset to begin a project before getting locked down into the software. I drafted out a couple ideas, starting with top-down representation, then breaking apart the continent into two separate maps to explain the dynamics of Western Antarctica versus Eastern Antarctica, and then two perspective maps for both sides of the continent. All options were drafted to fit a full spread, but then my colleague Jason Tree proposed the idea of a double gatefold. So I drafted out a full-blown perspective map of Antarctica that would feature the full continent. For context, a double gatefold is about 10 inches high and about 25 inches wide. So this isn't a space we frequently get, um, get for maps and graphics, and it's also one that not a lot of maps will fit into with the long horizontal space. The directors loved the idea, and we got, approve, got approval to move forward with the double gatefold. We had a set layout, and we also had our the thematic elements in place. We wanted to compare Western Antarctica and Eastern Antarctica, as Western Antarctica is melting a lot faster than Eastern Antarctica, with Eastern Antarctica picking up the pace in recent years. We wanted to demonstrate that ice is constantly on the move on Antarctica, and, um, or called ice velocity, and some places have been speeding up more than others due to climate change. We also wanted to explain what's going on under the ice, showing subglacial rivers with a cutaway, and to show how warming waters are changing the dynamics of the ice shelves that hold back the glacial ice on the continent. So once we had our draft set, our layout set, then we jumped in the software. Um, I worked with freelancer Steve Tyson to render the base map, in Maya, um, uh, the software he used, and our first step was to figure out which angle would best communicate the vastness of the continent. Our creative, creative director liked to refer to these grayscale versions, grayscale versions as Death Star renderings with the, <laughs> the gray color. Um, we also used this stage to figure out the appropriate shape for the under the ice cutout, which we ended up going with a more circular shape versus kind of a pie cutout, which was our initial, initial draft. Once we got the angle approved, we started to add color and continued to draft the map notes, small explainer graphics, and experiment with the locator map. My colleague Jason added some explainer graphics along the bottom of the spread, including a graphic of the Statue of Liberty to illustrate how much sea level, how much sea level, how much sea level would rise if all of the ice on Antarctica were to melt, 
We use this graphic to give a sense of just how much ice is on the continent. I also began to experiment with, with how to visualize the ice flow velocity, and in this version using uh, colored arrows to show the movement. We experimented with rendering sea ice around the continent, but it made it very, very, very busy and crowded. Uh, also, the, also, we realized the goal of this map was not to recreate the entire landscape of Antarctica. The goal was to give a window into the dynamics of the continent, and to do this, we needed to stay on the more graphic side spectrum rather than the rendering side spectrum in order to communicate the story. So to do this, we used a, li we used, um, a line to represent sea ice and a slight tin boundary to give the extent of the sea ice. We also ex expanded the locator map to show the average sea ice extent and the record low sea ice extent, clearing out more space on the main map for the map notes and graphic elements. Throughout all of these stages, we also continued to fine tune the map labels, graphics, and notes. I don't know if anyone noticed, but the title changed about three times throughout those three slides. So went from the bottom of the world to the melting, con melting of the continent and then the melting of Antarctica. Um, also, as you'll see in the bottom right, we simplified the Statue of Liberty graphic to not conflict with the overall feel of the map. And then this is the final version, um, which involved blending the map labels in with the landscape, adjusting lighting and shadows to emphasize volume, and the fine tuning of the final color ramp for the ice flow velocity shown in purple red and orange. To get that final product, every little tweak, adjustment, and content change made all the difference in creating the final piece. And some of, some of the changes that we went through multiple iterations had a lot more iterations than others. So one example we had was coming up with a key for the ice flow velocity um, to be an appropriate guide for the reader to interpret what was going on on the map. These are just five of the different versions um, we went, to, went through to determine what would be the most appropriate uh, key to show that ice velocity. We started out with broken apart categories, but then figured you know, we wanted to really emphasize this continuous nature of the ice flow. And so we moved to a continuous ramp, added a note to explain a little bit more with the key. And then with the final version on the bottom right, added a streaking texture to give it a little bit more connection with the texturing used on the actual map. Um, also, we still felt that it needed a little bit more emphasis to emphasize that flow of ice. And so we experimented with adding arrows on the ice shelves to emphasize the constant movement of the ice, particularly at the ice shelves. This was the first version of arrows we went through. They were a little too blocky. Then we tried some larger chevron arrows that were a bit big and distracting. Um, then we tried some smaller <laughs> chevron arrows, um, also a little distracting. And then um, the freelancer added some texturing to the, to the ice flow velocity, and we felt, well, maybe this will work, just adding a little bit of flow, flowing texture. Um, still felt like it needed a little bit more, so I came up with these very thin, more delicate arrows that weren't distracting, they weren't going to stand out too much, but they were there if the, reader, if the reader needed them to interpret what was going on in the map. And we also took a lot of inspiration from some of the older National Geographic maps as well. As well. Mm -hmm. This map of Greenland inspired the use of the golf flag to represent the South Pole and emphasize perspective in a very subtle way. This is also one of my like, favorite National Geographic maps. But, um, and then also taking from past examples of cutaways at the poles to explain what lies beneath the ice or the water. And then it was also not the first time we did, Antarct did a map of Antarctica in the perspective either. So this one showing the Antarctica from the bottom um, as the bottom of the world. But once we were done with the final print piece, we needed to move on to create something for the digital platform. So myself and my colleague Jason Treat sat down and we came up with this sketchboard to sketch out how we wanted to tell this story digitally. Um, we created this. Um, in the idea of doing a digital, um, digital scrolling piece. But one idea that I proposed that I, I thought would be very interesting to try would, was a video representation of, of our graphic. Try something new, try something different, and also try something that would work for mobile, it would work for desktop, and it could be shared among a lot of platforms and um, embedded in the story online as well. Um, so we teamed up, so Jason and I teamed up with producer Hans Weiss and animator Jennifer Smart uh, to make this video, and I'll show you a brief clip of that.
So one of the big oh. <laughs> um, one of the biggest challenges of the digital version digital version was keeping a cohesive look and feel with the original print piece. So we didn't use well for the graphics we used reused a lot of the assets, but for the maps they were completely rebuilt maps because um, that big lawn horizontal map was not going to fit <laughs> in a video, um, and also tell the different pieces we needed to. So. Um, so I worked to remake all the maps, matching Steve Tyson's beautiful style that he did in the perspective maps to give that similar look and feel and lighting and color to, to the maps that were featured, featured in the video. And um, for the beginning and closing slides, we use beautiful renderings, as you can see in the Melting of Antarctica one by Charles Prepperna, um, to give an intro and just kind of general feel to what you were getting, getting into with the video. Um, below is a link that will take you to the video and other Antarctica content that we did for the issue. And I also have a copy of the July issue, too, if anyone wants to take a closer look at the map or if anyone has any questions. So thank you.